Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and um, before we start, Jawbreakers Forever Graphic Novel. Grand Bazaar is getting out to pretty much everyone has it by now. And uh, the next book, The Jawbreakers Contingency, I wrote the first 12 pages. Those are being finished right now. And then I wrote the last like 30 pages uh, because the middle, it's one of those really complicated like murder mystery. So I was like, oh, that's the complicated part. I told Aaron, I go, I, I wrote enough script pages to take you through until next year. And I'll write the middle during that time. Ironside 3 Impossible Stars 2 combo campaign. And uh, I just love this so much. Ultimate Avengers. Uh, I didn't know this existed. Every time I heard about an Ultimate Avengers Marvel comic, I thought it was an adaptation of those two animated movies from that time. I didn't realize it was, it was his own series. But uh, one thing I noticed after reading a bunch of these in one day, Mark Millar, during this period in his career, he really liked people just tumbling through the air. I don't mean specifically like jumping like Daredevil or uh, or Spider-Man. No, it, it, okay, this is like the first one where he doesn't have people just cascading, pinwheeling through the air as like, I don't know, it was like a motif for him uh, at the time. So there's a, oh, there we go. We got the freaking ragdoll physics. Like, this is a guarantee. Like, in every issue, somebody's just going to be freaking ragdolling it through the air. So Perch did something amazing. Somebody wrote in, and they basically alluded to my, you know, we need to go back. And he brought that up. And we need to go back can be interpreted many different ways. And Perch did something that's unheard of. He actually tried to assume what I meant by it. He assumed correctly, and he didn't do it in a way to make you know himself look good or me look stupid or evil. And the idea is we need to go back to the things that worked while ignoring all the things that didn't work. Now, I've done many videos about what I think worked in the past. So let's talk about what didn't. So Last Known Good, it's a basic troubleshooting concept commonly used in IT. When did this peripheral, when did this workstation, when did this network last work correctly? Okay, what's changed since then? What did you do on purpose? What did somebody else do and not tell you about? What was done accidentally? Was there a storm? What was the last known good? So what I want to talk about is things that used to be done that I hated. The thing that I didn't like in old comics was an obsession with timeliness. They were periodicals. They had to come out once a month. And so what they did is they developed this concept of the fill-in issue, the inventory issue. And that was almost exclusively a no-stakes generic story that was literally just wasting everyone's time. Sometimes done by people who were growing in their career. You know, you'd be like, you know, Peter David would be like, yeah, so uh, I'm in Spectacular Spider-Man. I wrote that three years ago and it's, you know, just been sitting in a shelf and now they're late. So, okay, go read it. It's a good story. I'm a better writer now. But the artists tended to be Rich Buckler and Terry Shoemaker. One of the things I'm uh, so shocked by when I go back and I try to read a run on X-Men. Hey, remember when uh, Gambit was created and he was introduced and Storm had been de-aged by, uh, what was it, Orphan Maker and Mommy? Well, I mean, it was that egg-shaped creature. Holy shit! It's like a different artist almost every issue for a whole year. And then you get this other thing where you will have stuff like, you know, an annual, and you'll be like, oh, cool, Art Adams is doing an annual. The first 14 pages and the cover look amazing. Then he starts having a different inker for every four pages, and then, like, the, they, they usually, like, on the last page, it would be done correctly, but, like, those five pages before the last page, it would be, like, Bob Wycheck doing finishes over breakdowns. Now, my solution would have been to have the annuals be the fill-in issues. 
What I mean is you go to someone who's really good but slow. Adam Hughes. Art Adams. And you say, hey, we've got this story. It doesn't have to fit, you know, directly into current continuity. People will kind of understand that it happened recently in the Marvel Universe. And what you're going to do is you're going to do amazing work on every single page. So, if we have to interrupt a story because the main artist is late or got sick or whatever then all of a sudden we're gonna take your annual we're gonna split it into two issues and there's gonna be this awesome two issue Art Adams interlude where he is hitting on all cylinders on every single page and then we'll get back to the story and I mean I'm telling you like as much as you remember it's like oh yeah Todd McFarlane he drew every issue nope he didn't you're just blanking out the ones where, you know, he or Mark Sylvester or whoever you really liked, you remember them being on X-Men or Spider-Man or whatever for a couple years. They were on for a couple years, but they would take one, two, three months off. Number two, advertising beyond advertising. I'm not talking about an ad for Three Musketeers Bar. That's fine. Although when I go through these older books and they actually scan the ads, Europeans especially, they're like losing their mind. Like, how can you read this? It, it completely breaks up the flow. I, I don't really see them. I just, you know, flip the page. But they would do this specifically in the late 70s, early 1980s, where they would just completely obliterate like the top fourth of the covers for like every Marvel comic for a month so they could advertise like a huffy bike giveaway. So at the time it was annoying, but then when you're going through the old comics, you're like, what the fuck? This is ridiculous. They would also do this thing where they would do half pages or, you know, when times was tough, they would just shorten it down. Uh, DC did this more where you get like a main story that was like 15 and a half pages and they would just obliterate one half of a page to be an ad. One half of a sequential page. A third thing I didn't really like was when they tried to have a unified field theory. Yes, you can do a multiverse. I don't want Spider-Man to meet Spider-Ham. Spider-Ham takes place not even in a universe. He's just a silly comic. It's like saying like, where is Dennis the Menace in this world? He's not in any other world. He's just a comic. So stop trying to make Alf meets Spider-Ham, and then Spider-Ham meets Spider-Man, and now you're like, Alf? What? No. It's perfectly fine to have some characters interact, and some of them are just never going to meet. It's better if you kind of do some retconning of your own, and you say, Daredevil exists in a Marvel Universe, but it's not the one with Galactic. It's the one that has like Spider-Man and Luke Cage, and that's about it. So company-wide crossovers to me were always very, very awkward. It's like, what is Daredevil doing on the moon? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you've almost broken that character taking him to the moon. You take him to the very top of the highest skyscraper in Manhattan. That's as far as he goes. I don't even want to see him on a shield helicarrier. He's a street level hero. That's it. He can meet Spider-Man. I don't want him meeting the Fantastic Four. Ever. Speaking of which, there are more than two lawyers in the Marvel Universe. She-Hulk or Matt Murdock cannot represent everyone. The first time I saw that, I thought it was witty and fun. And now you just assume it. Oh no. Peter Parker's got a whole bunch of parking tickets. And we cut to the scene and Matt Murdock. What the f What is your specialty, Matt Murdock? Anything? That's your specialty. Torts and freaking criminal court and civil court and family court. Like, just everything. E every law in the world. That's your focus. Lastly, franchising. In-universe franchising. I don't want to hear that every single character is a legacy. I'm watching this Thor Love and Thunder 
and they basically gaslit America. After just referring to Thor as a person, Jane Foster pops back in after eight years, and nobody missed her. And then Valkyrie, I'm sorry, King Valkyrie, who's a woman, says, uh, Oh, you're a Thor. That's not a thing! Even though every story counts as a story for the overall mega story of a universe, you don't constantly have to bring in every single thing that was ever published. Because sometimes the shit is bad or weird or it just doesn't match up. Please keep Daredevil off the moon. Please. Thank you. Anyway, before I go, Jawbreakers Forever, Ironsides 3, Impossible Stars 2. Thanks for watching. Bye.